Hello, and thank you for joining Retirement and Succession Planning for Veterinarians, featuring Mr. Chandler McLean. I'm Nicole Cast, CE Program Manager for the MVMA, and I'm pleased to be your moderator today. If you have any questions during the session, please type them in the Q&A area. I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Chandler McLean is the Vice President and business banker at Bank of America West with more than 10 years of experience working with small business owners and private practices. He helps to facilitate successful private practice transitions across the Midwest, including succession and retirement planning with retiring veterinarians. Please, Chandler, go ahead. Thanks, Nicole, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully uh, an enjoyable discussion here while you enjoy your lunches. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all and uh, appreciate the introduction as well as Nicole mentioned. My name is Chandler McLean. You may have seen me around. I've been a MVMA supporting member and sponsor for the better part of the last uh, four or five years and have really enjoyed my time working with the organization and taking part in different events and speaking opportunities like this. So for the past about decade, I've been working exclusively with small business owners with a specialty in healthcare, private practice owners. And in that time, have worked on a number of different transactions and different client situations, and that's what really led me to the topic that we'll get into today, which as Nicole mentioned is retirement and succession planning for veterinarians. It's a topic that interests me for several different reasons. For one, as someone in finance and banking in particular, we pay attention to a lot of the trends that are happening, the demographic changes that are happening within our communities and, and across the country and the world, really. And so it's something that we pay close attention to at Bank of the West in particular, uh, where we have kind of a global network with banks all across the world. And as it relates to this topic, as we all know, there is what you'd consider, and it sounds impersonal, but an aging population of business owners. So the baby boomers in particular are getting to the point where retirement is on the horizon and there is now the, the largest population segment, the millennials and, and Gen Xers, I would, I would lump in there too on the, on the other side of this, of the spectrum, being in a position to come in and take over these businesses uh, or that, that need to backfill for the ownership group that's going to be exiting or making or executing on these succession plans, retiring, hopefully. And so it's something that's happening across all industries. It's a, a very prevalent trend. We're right at the kind of the tip of the spear on this now, and it's only going to become more and more prevalent as the years continue to pass by. And so what I've noticed is that in working with, with small business owners in particular is that these are some of the busiest people that I've ever come into contact with in my life. And then you couple that with, with veterinarians, healthcare practitioners, probably the busiest of the busiest, right? And so with managing and juggling multiple responsibilities from those roles, a lot of times retirement and succession planning in particular is overlooked. And it's because you, in many cases, so speaking to the business owners, are the chairman or the chairwoman and the board. They're the HR director and the marketing specialist and the coffee person or the, the one who, you know, turns out the lights and, and cleans the break room at night. And so with all those responsibilities on their plates, it le it's, it's easy to overlook things that feel like they're far into the future, but a lot of times it really comes up on you quick, and it turns out that even if it seems like it's you know, a retirement or a succession event, is way off into the future, and so you can push that aside for the more immediate needs that you have to take care of. It's good to, when you can, 
have these conversations as early as possible. I mean, in a best case scenario, we actually recommend that this is something that's thought about from day one, whether that's a scratch start or uh, from purchasing an existing practice. And, you know, so a lot of the topics that we're going to get into revolve around the small business owner, the, the private practice veterinarian owner and, and potential owners of the future. Um, but this is applicable also to those that are not in private practice and who work at a corp in a corporate setting or who want to be more of an associateship employee and, and don't have ownership aspirations. That's okay. Same rules apply in terms of plan early, start as early as possible, and really be thinking about these things from day one if you can. But this, the next best time to start is, is right now today, as they say. And so that's, uh, that's really the message for today. I mean, I've worked on hundreds of, of veterinary and, and medical small business transitions. I've worked with thousands of small business owners across the country. And so a lot of this is my observations and, and research during that time and what can I add to the conversation with that experience that will be helpful to a wide range of people. And, and like I said, it's applicable. Uh, primarily the goal of this is to speak to small business owners or those who have a future as a small business owner. But these principles are applicable to everyone, um, even regardless of if you're in a medical field or a veterinary field or not. We all have to be thinking about these things and kind of planning for the future. It's the easiest thing to overlook when we're caught up in, in the moment. And so that's why I wanted to take some time over the lunch hour to, to touch on some of these things. As Nicole mentioned, and as I said too, I'm a vice president business banker at Bank of the West. So these are, I, I think, valid observations that I've had from my time in the field, but I do need to point out that I'm not an attorney, I'm not a CPA, I'm not a, a lawyer. Uh, so a lot of these will be my opinion, and obviously, and we, we touch on this too later on in the presentation, those are all people that you want to have on your team, and so I'd recommend no matter what, walk of life or profession or stage of your career that you're in, you have a team, a support team built out of professionals. I fill one of those roles. I don't have all of that, you know, I don't claim to have all of those expertises. And so it's important to know as many people as possible uh, as you're going through the different stages of your career and life. So I'll jump in. Nicole, just let me know if the slide sharing is having any issues. We should be looking at an overview of the topics that we'll discuss today. And Everything's in looking a, great. Perfect. Thank you. So in the course of an hour, obviously, we're going to be taking a lot of broad strokes. Uh, there's ways that we can really dive into these topics. If anybody has any questions or anything comes to mind as we go through this, by all means, chime in, interrupt me. Nicole, I like it to be as free-flowing as possible, and so no worries there. If there's something that we want to dig into more, let's go for it. Otherwise, it's going to be a lot of kind of overarching themes and things to think about that might or might not be applicable to you, but if there's anything that's of particular interest, then let's, let's take a deeper dive. So a lot of this, is, of course, is going to be around some financial planning, succession planning for business owners, what are different strategies that you can employ for both of those topics. If you are a, pra a private practice owner, how do you value that practice when it comes time to sell or to plan your exit strategy? What, are, what is the process once you get to that point? So when you do sell or when you do transition out of your practice, what does that look like? What are some key benchmarks and metrics to think about? We touched on a little bit of building a support team. So in any case, you're going to need a team of professionals to help you through all these various stages of your career. And then, of course, the fun part is a worry for retirement, which we all hope for, and that's the goal of going through some of these steps, which is, at times are can be onerous or arduous and uh, it's, that's why it's best to start early 
and hopefully get to that point where it's it's easier at the end. That's what we're all working towards. You know, it's, I, I've been reading up recently preparing for this presentation, and in the veterinary field in particular, you're a little bit put behind from the start of your career. So if you think about early on in your careers, it requires more schooling, which is more debt. So an average college graduate is going to finish their undergraduate degree early 20s, call it 22, and they're going to go out into the workforce and make somewhere on average between, if they have a four-year degree, call it 40 to 60,000 a year. In the meantime, if you're in vet school, you're going to spend the next handful of years there accumulating additional debt, get out in your mid to late 20s, or if it was a career change, sometimes later than that still, you have more debt. The entry level earning is probably a touch higher, but certainly disproportionate to where uh, a regular kind of undergraduate degree will have put somebody over the course of those following five years. And you're later in your life in terms of where you want to be personally. So then it comes time to do family planning and buying a house. Uh, and, and you've started that financial clock a little later. So you couple those things together and it can put a strain on finances in particular. And that's where you know, this is a topic that's especially important to me, working with a number of, of medical veterinary professionals, that those are, that's a, I wouldn't say a tough hand to be dealt, but it definitely creates some additional challenges or com some complexity, I would say, to your financial picture that's very important to think about early on. Obviously, the upside of it is that as you get further in your professional life cycle, especially with private practice ownership, which I'm almost always in favor of, the earning potential is exponentially higher, whereas like a regular, or I call it regular, but whereas like a, a non-medical four-year undergraduate degree, it typically is, can cap earning potential without additional schooling or I guess a little luck or natural talent with, uh, with a veterinary degree and with the opportunities that exist for private practice ownership, real estate ownership, entrepreneurship, you can really take that a lot further in terms of earning potential and future opportunity than the majority of other professions. And so that's where it's an enviable position, but it does require kind of thinking about things up front and determining what your priorities are and what your strategies are going to be to achieve those. So let's talk a little bit then about the financial life cycle of veterinarians and couple that with the company financial life cycle of a veterinarian business. And so you can see there's a graphic on this slide that goes through a business life cycle from startup to growth mode to a maturing business and then finally to a transitioning business, which in this context we would think of as perhaps retiring or transitioning the business to new ownership. Now this works though both professionally but also on a personal level. So think of the context of say an academic career where you can also you can look at it almost as freshman through senior year there's a similar growth that happens through through that personal life cycle and the same can be applied to a, to personal finances early in your career you're setting out, deciding what it is that you want to do. You find that niche and grow in that professional space. It grows your personal finances. You get to the middle ages where now you're making good money or you're, you're, you're reaching the higher levels of earning potential within your profession. And then finally you get to retirement. So this works both for private practice ownership and also for those that are not in ownership, because it's, you think of it as the same way. Our finances are very much a life cycle, and 
throughout the stages of that life cycle, there's different needs and different priorities. There's different strategies that can be put into place during that life cycle. And it's important to recognize where you are within that cycle and then also determine what your priorities and strategies are appropriately based on where you are. And so it runs, concur it runs um, similarly, a company, a business life cycle, and a, and a personal financial life cycle, but they don't necessarily run concurrent or parallel. You could be at a different place personally with your finances than the company is. You could be established within your career and then decide to scratch start a practice or decide to move out of corporate when, you're, when your financial position is maturing and go buy an existing practice. And then your personal financial situation is going to be more mature, but your business financial situation is more in the startup phase. And so it's important to think about both of those factors, personal and professional, financial life cycle, where you are, because that will determine what sort of strategies and what sort of tactics make sense, both, again, both personally and professionally. So to go through that quickly, I would say on the business side, as you're earlier in the, the life cycle, the planning topics that are especially important would be where to invest your seed capital or, or your startup capital and investing intelligently. When you're in the growth cycle, you're going to recognize what are your strengths and weaknesses. Obviously try to eliminate the weaknesses as much as you can, but more so really try to encourage and develop the strengths that you're seeing from your financial position. As you're maturing, now you should be to the point as a business where you have it pretty well locked down, what makes the business tick, what makes it money, how to keep your profit margins and your revenue at good levels. If there's any variances, you should know where they come from. And then as you get to the end of the maturing stage and move into the transitioning stage of your business, you're prepping to transition, your succession planning. So that means buttoning up your financial statements, getting the practice to a point where it's marketable to the very, in the very best light, you know, similar to how if you're selling a house, you want nice clean cut grass, fresh paint on the, on the exterior and, and interior. Maybe there's some, some improvements that you do. You want to put things in the best light and not do that haphazardly. On the personal side, of your life cycle, number one, again, the best advice is start early. And if you haven't started yet, the next best time to start is now. That's when you're in the startup phase. As you grow, you're, you're finding out what you enjoy, where you're able to have success, and then you can start to diversify some of your savings and investment vehicles. In the maturing stage is when you want to start transitioning, less so from a growth outlook and more so maybe to a protection outlook. So this is where you look at things like long-term care and uh, life insurance, annuities, uh, different uh, health care provisions that you'll need. And then obviously you move into personally the transitioning phase, which is transitioning out of active employment and into retirement. So as you can see, it's a there's similar life cycles, and this is very broad strokes again, but what, whether it's personally for your finances or as a small business owner for your company finances, it's, it's a cycle. They're similar, and you're going to want to recognize where you are in both facets because they're not going to be the same in all cases. So since we've discussed how the overall cycle works and the overall timeline of a professional or personal financial spectrum, what that looks like. Let's talk about some of the end game or the succession planning strategies. And so here is 
an overview of some of the topics that I talk to many of my business clients about on a daily basis. And this is a fraction of, as, as many of you know, of the overall concerns and, and thoughts of a business owner. There's hundreds of different things that you have to consider in that position. And these are just some of them. And these are, these are big deals. Things like tax issues, cash flow variants, how do you keep your best employees, especially in the type of labor market that we have in Minnesota in particular, it is wound as tight as ever. And so keeping good people and giving them the benefits that they need or require or can get down the street is harder than ever. Multiple different vendor or banking relationships. How do you keep track of all of your money and all the different movement of money? This is a newer concept as well that's, that's growing exponentially by the day. Things like electronic fund transfers, wire transfers, online tax payments, moving money between different financial institutions. It used to be a lot more simple back when there, there was a Main Street bank and you would go down and visit your banker and the, the teller cage is what we used to call them and there'd be somebody behind the desk, you'd bring in your deposit slips and, uh, or, or a withdraw if you needed to take money out and you did balancing checkbooks. We all remember some of that even in recent history. Everything's online now, everything's electronic. Blockchain isn't going away. Um, Fraud is more prevalent than ever because of the prevalence of, of online account and money movement activity. So that's just another facet of, of this overall thought process that a business owner has to go through on a daily basis, solving problems all the time, uh, or not even just problems, but just different responsibilities and tasks that are required of a business owner. It is for someone like me that's not in that space, but it can definitely emphasize from having worked with people there, it can be overwhelming. So you move into, well, let's kind of break it down then. Let's talk about specifically succession planning and what are some strategies and tactics. And so when I say succession planning, exit strategy, when you as a business owner move out of ownership, what are some things you can do to put yourself in a better position? One thing that I think is underutilized, even though it's recognized as being very important, is mentorship. And I'll tell you, even in, in corporate America, which is where I work, it's a, it's a strategy that we recognize as being important, but don't always, or, or actually I would say frankly rarely, get right. So we're all trying to do this. We all recognize that it's important, but it's not always something that is executed how you'd want it to be. And so I think we should start by defining what does it mean? Well, so mentorship is a period of time during which a person receives guidance from a mentor. So take it a, a step further in the, in the context of, of veterinary medicine, there is a seasoned experienced veterinarian as the mentor and the mentee is going to be, let's call them a junior associate or junior veterinarian and the senior is going to have much more valuable experience and insights and just knowledge from their years of being in the job. I always say the best way, or at least for me, to learn a lesson is, is with lumps on the head. It tends to sink in a little better and, and it is more memorable certainly. And so having that context as the more senior person, more senior doctor, that's, that is gold to somebody that's in a junior position. Now they're gonna need to obviously go through some of those challenges themselves and experience it the same way that we all did going through it but it certainly helps to have some of that context from a mentor. And so I think one of the common things 
misconceptions about a mentorship is that it's praise when they do well as a mentee and, and punishment or uh, basically calling somebody out for when they don't do well. And that's not what a mentor relationship, uh, that, that, that is a mentor relationship, but it's not the most effective version. I think what really is helpful for a mentorship is to have predetermined outcomes that both people want, both the mentor and the mentee, have them clearly defined in terms of what are the expectations, have measurable expectations that also have benchmarks for tracking. So how often is it going to be twice a year that we meet up, you know, mid-year and end of year is the real common way. And we're going to say, okay, how did we do on our, on our goals that we had set up on the front end? And then maintaining that. So just having consistency around those activities. And I think if you have, if you make sure to include those different components of a mentor arrangement and really formalize something, it can be much more meaningful. Obviously difficult to pull off. We're all busy. It's an easy, it's the easiest thing or the first thing to go if when we get especially busy. But if you can make this a priority, the very best transitions that I've, that I see in my opinion are when it's an existing associate at the practice who is buying it from the retiring owner and they have been mentored or groomed um, to put them in the best position to succeed after the succession post-succession or after the transition event. Hard to do, but in my opinion, the very best situation uh, for the ongoing success of the business, which is important for the outgoing business owner, and then the ongoing success of the individual who takes over as the new owner. So mentorship, very important. Obviously, it's, it's pretty aspirational because it's not always feasible. But if you can, that's a really important piece to have. The second strategy I want to talk about is business financial management. And so this is a really tricky one when it comes to the small business, private practice, veterinarian owner, to separate the emotional component. This is my baby. This is my lifeblood. I created this from the ground up, from the foundation to where it is today and built it up and separate that from objective measures. So here is the cash flow of the business. That's an objective measure. You can determine that down to the penny. That's a lot different than I spent the last 30 years growing this from nothing, working 14 hour days and I've built up a, a business that's going to last for decades longer. That's, that's emotional. That's, that's subjective. That, that, that can't be measured the same way that financial metrics can, or that patient, uh, that the patient population or the um, customer count can, or the follow-up that you have with the follow-up procedures that you have with your customers and and patients. Understanding financial statements and the key metrics that a potential buyer will look for. So as we all know, as a private practice owner, there's several different buyers that are available. We'll get more into that later. Obviously it can be an existing associate, it can be a corporate entity. Everyone's gonna start with the financial statements, not to mention people like me who finance these deals, we're gonna start at the same place. And so understand some of the big topics of discussion around your financial statements that are going to take place. So I would say some of those that come top of mind, things like trending, are your sales level? Are they going down? Are they going up? Do we know why they're going down or up? Is profit margin consistent? Do we know why it is or is not consistent? Was there one-time expenses that happened? Is there some expense cutting that's happening to make the business more lean and profitable in the future? Those are things that are really important. Uh, also, 
how much what I, what I would think it was kind of fluff goes into those financial statements. And obviously there's tax strategy that's okay to use, which is writing off every expense under the sun. I mean, at, at the, at its most, at its highest level. So I've seen mileage and employee vehicles and um, owners retirement plans and golf club memberships are pretty popular in this part of the country different things like that, you, you can write those off as business expenses. There's a lot of leeway there for small business owners to, to do that, but understand that when you get to a point of selling that asset, of selling the business, that's when it becomes a lot harder or more complicated to explain those or to have those be justified or to, to get maximum value out of your asset, out of the business that you're selling, much harder to do when you have a lot of that stuff going on. So if you do, like I said, it's an okay tax strategy, but document everything. If you have a golf club membership that's rolling through as membership and dues on your tax return, save the end of your invoice from the country club. That should match up pretty much dollar for dollar, and that's easy enough for me as the banker and for a buyer as the new owner of the practice to add that back to the cash flow. If you're running a vehicle lease, save your lease statements, have your end of the year loan statement or lease statement with the totals in the name of the business available. If you don't, it's near impossible for somebody both in the banker chair who's financing that sale or from the buyer chair who's putting their name on the line to accept them at face value. It's almost impossible. And you can understand why, I would imagine, because if you don't have it documented, it just doesn't really hold up. So I guess I, maybe I'll stop here, Nicole. Is there any questions at this point we've we've talked through a lot of different topics from some retirement strategies what are some things to think about it in different parts of your financial life cycle both professionally and personally what are strategies for when you get to the point of selling a practice potentially or getting near the end of your professional career? Is there anything that we've touched on so far that people have questions about or want to dig into a little deeper? Um, could you tell us about some common tax strategies that you've seen on recent transactions? Yes. Um, so again, Really good question, but I'm not a CPA or an attorney, and so I can't give formal tax advice. Obviously, you'll want to talk to your person, and every situation is unique. So with that caveat, some things that, I, that I've seen, uh, for one, when a sale event happens for a business, so when someone comes in and, and buys a business, there's two different ways that that can happen. One is a stock sale, which is, I would consider to be less common in my experience, where the buyer is buying everything basically as is. They're, they're taking over the existing business, they're keeping the name, they're keeping the history, all of the assets and liabilities, the tax ID number, and they're transferring, they're basically taking the equity that the seller or the previous owner had and they're purchasing it all and putting it in their name. That's a stock sale. Probably a little bit more advantageous to the seller from a tax standpoint, but that is one way to do it. The other way is an asset sale, and that's where the buyer is strictly going in to purchase the assets of the seller business. They're going to create a new entity to purchase those assets. So the buyer is coming in and basically starting a new business, but they're taking on all of the assets and none of the liabilities of the seller so that they can have something that is turnkey when they do, quote, unquote, start their new business. So a stock sale would be the other option for handling a, a business transaction, a business sale like this. 
when it comes to a stock sale, there, well, in both cases, but in the stock sale, it's, it's very important for the buyer and seller to have an agreement on the allocation of the purchase proceeds. And so by that, I mean what portion of the purchase money is going towards hard assets like equipment or the fixtures within the practice itself, patient records, and then what portion of it is going to what we call goodwill or blue sky, which is the intangible value of the business. There's big tax implications depending on the allocations of the purchase money. And one thing that I've seen in particular more prevalent, well, there's two things that I've seen more prevalent recently. One is where we do kind of a staggered sale where it's a, a portion of the, the business or a portion of the total price is paid out in one calendar year and the other half or the, the next installment is paid off the next year or the year after that or, or in installments. And that's a way to spread out for the seller some of the gains that they're going to pay on the sale proceeds. So that's one that I've seen where it's, I call it kind of like an installment sale. That seems to be pretty popular lately. The other one is when they're doing the allocation of the sale proceeds, they'll include a component for consulting to the seller. So let's just say it's a million dollar purchase. The seller would, of that million dollars, let's just say 900,000 of it goes toward purchasing assets and goodwill. So buying the equipment, buying the, the, the value of the business. And the other 100,000 is gonna be paid directly to the seller as a consulting fee. Why that's important is because the, as it's been described to me, the, the portion that is carved out as a consulting fee can be taken as regular wages to the seller, where the majority of the other proceeds are taxed at the capital gains rates. And so there's some advantage there to carving out a portion. And so that's where, where I see some creativity is both kind of the itemizing of the sale proceeds and then also the schedule for when it's paid out. And the takeaway from all of it, though, is that I've done deals across the board that have those different structures. And so it's possible to do those things. You just have to work it out on the front end. Everybody has to agree to it. But in terms of the nuts and bolts or the mechanics of the deal, it, it can be done. So again, you want to, if you're at that point, talk to your attorney, talk to your CPA, talk to your banker, make sure everything lines up. But there is a lot of latitude for handling these transactions in, in different ways or having different tax or, or legal strategy involved. That's why you have those people on your team to help you set up those things. So really good question. Thank you. Any others before we move on? Uh, not right now. A reminder, though, if you do have questions, to please type them in the Q&A area. Thank you. Awesome. All right. So then we'll move into, you get to the point where, now this is going to be much more specific to the private practice owner where you're selling your practice. So the, the big question that comes up early on, and again, these are things to think about, not right when you're ready to sell, but years in advance, but the two factors that determine the worth of a practice, the two most important factors, I would say, are cash flow and risk. Of the two, cash flow to me is the most important and it's not close. So at the end of the day, how much is the owner able to take home when you'd have the, the different ad backs factored in, you factor in the potentially the loan payment, whether that's through a bank or the seller is going to be the, the lender where they do a, what's called like a seller carry note where they sell it off or sweat equity to the buyer that's paid out through the salary of the new owner. 
cash flow is going to drive all of that. So that's the most important factor. Cash flow is king. Again, we can we can get that number down to the penny by looking at financial statements. And when you're in the position of selling or buying for that matter, you need to determine that number right away up front. Risk is less clear cut. So when it comes to risk as a factor in determining the worth of a practice, it can be a number of different things. So it's much more nuanced because every practice is different and has different levels of risk, different risk categories. But some of the things that you see are specialized capabilities of the selling doctor. So maybe they are the very best at one very particular niche area of medicine and the buyer doesn't have that. Well, that's going to be a risk. How do you backfill that revenue or how do you, can you acquire the training to deliver on that specialty? Local competition, whether that's corporate or private, is there new entities coming in and, and taking away potential clients? Staffing is huge. Who's going to stay on or what do the employment contracts look like? Is the practice staffed by the seller's family members who probably aren't going to stick around for long, or what is the plan there? What's the quality of the staffing? Lease considerations. So do you have a long time left on the lease that the buyer can assume? Can the buyer assume it, or will they have to negotiate a new lease with the landlord? Quality of the equipment, experience level of the buyer, and how well their personality fits with the staff, with the clients. And that's, again, where it goes back to best case scenario, you have somebody in-house. I've had, I've had deals where the clients thought that the buyer was the owner already because they were there so often. They were so much a part of the, basically the overall operation of the practice, they were, the, they were almost the face of the practice that the clients just assumed, oh yeah, she must be the owner and had no idea that they were just now buying the practice. So uh, as far as like a magic number, the caveat here is there is many different ways to value a private practice. Typically in the vet space, we see practices sell between 60 and 80% of a three-year average weighted revenue. So take your last three years, average amount, and typically it's going to be somewhere in the 60 to 80% range for your total sale price or what the market is willing to pay. And so that's what we're seeing most often on vet practice transitions. The weighting that is involved in that is if there's a dip in revenue in the most recent year or if it's trending up, then perhaps you put more weight on the most recent year or, or less weight depending on the trending of the numbers overall. But in general, three-year average is typically right about there, 60 to 80 percent. Again, there's many different ways to do this. Obviously, there's variables like if you're selling the building, if you're staying on for a period of time as the seller and helping to retain additional or it retain the business that the, the client base that the business has, if you're selling off just a portion of the business, et cetera, et cetera. There's, a, there's, there's myriad different variables that factor into this. General rule of thumb, 60 to 80 percent of a three-year average revenue of the business. The other caveat that's becoming more and more of a discussion topic is that corporate buyers are almost always and certainly often exceeding this range for their purchase price. And so it, it you know, that's, that's just the reality, right? And, and what I've seen, how that's affected in this market in particular, private practice transitions is that it's driving up the price, or in a lot of cases, it's pricing out the private practitioner individual buyer because corporate can come in and beat their offer by 20%. And so it's definitely something to keep in mind. You know, we'll talk about that, I think, on the, you know, one of the next slides here coming up. 
that there's different buyers and with different capabilities, corporate is one of those that is really becoming a factor uh, mainly because they can do that godfather offer where it's coming in and blowing everybody else away. But as the seller, is that some is that what you want? And and if it is, great. If it's not, think about these things up front because it's a big difference between a private buyer and a corporate buyer. So to that end, a few of the different options for potential buyers of a private practice, if that is your exit strategy for retirement, if that is your succession plan to sell, which I think if you're in private practice, it, it in almost every case, should be your exit strategy. That's an asset that can be sold at market, and it's never been easier to do this. Here are the options of potential buyers who can come in and make a deal with you. So you have, we've already talked about the current associate. This person's great if it's the right person because you can potentially have mentored them. They have a strong connection to the practice. The clients are going to feel no disruption in service because they're already familiar with this person. Where I've seen these go bad, though, is when the negotiation doesn't go right. So let's say the current associate thinks that they're going to get um, a hometown discount or that they have a different opinion of what that practice is worth, that can cause some friction. And I've seen it go, frankly, I've seen it go really bad. Typically, not common for it to go bad, but something to keep in mind, work on these things early, smooth it out, because it is a negotiation at the end of the day. Outside associates can come in and purchase, so whether that's somebody that's working at a competing practice, somebody that already owns a practice, that's a competing practice, these people are often ambitious, so they want to be entrepreneurs, they want to be business owners, easily financed. I would say both for the private buyer and also corporate, the access to capital and the money that's available to finance these transactions has never been easier. For a private buyer who's going through somebody like me, I can finance them 100% in fact, more than 100%, so they don't have to put a dollar into the deal. We'll give them money so that they have working capital or funds available to help them with the first few months after the transition. 100%, so they don't have to put any money into the deal. Corporate obviously has deep pockets. They can come in and, and close in a week if they wanted to. Never been easier to find buyers or to finance buyers. So, so these outside associates easily financed. Hard part of it, or the, the downside, is not always easy to determine if they're a good fit. Because this is somebody, now I know that the vet community in particular, very close-knit. You tend to kind of know who's out there, who's, who's talking, and a lot of times these, these deals happen off-market. Whether at the MVMA annual conference and having a conversation during a break from classes and I'll find out, oh, well, they're looking to sell and I'm looking to buy. Let's uh, meet for coffee in a couple weeks. So you can usually get a sense, especially if you're selling locally for who this person is, but not always. And in the cases where you don't, where it's coming through a broker or it's coming, you know, secondhand, not somebody that you're familiar with, they can be tough negotiators. Multiple associates are becoming more popular. I think some of the younger demographics enjoy having a team around them or having more people that, that work together as opposed to going it alone. These are typically pretty easy to finance as well because you have the financial strength of multiple sponsors, multiple guarantors. They can typically pay faster on a seller carry and so, so again that's where like if you're selling a practice for a million dollars, you'll just write up a contract where the buyers will pay you back that million with interest over X period of time. There's hybrid versions where you can say, I will carry, in the case of a million dollar sale, I'll, I'll take half a million, and you can go to a bank to get the other half a million. And so I'll get my half million from the bank up front, the other half million you pay me over time. If you have multiple associates who are paying into that seller carry arrangement, they can typically pay off faster because they have multiple streams of income. 
the downside to these is more so on the back end for the multiple associates themselves, more chefs in the soup, right, where there's just more competing ideas, different strategies, people go through different life events or have something happen or they have disagreements, so you really have to have a, a cohesive pairing or a cohesive group when you have these group practices or multiple associate practices that can work together well. And again, the, one of the overarching themes, plan ahead, plan ahead, that have had these conversations way up front so that they can determine some of the kind of boundaries or outline for how they want the business to run. And then we talked a little bit about those corporate buyers. No secret there, they will pay a premium. They will pay more than almost any private buyer can pay. Downside, super important, is the employment contracts. So in almost every case, they're gonna want, the corporate entity is going to want the selling doctor to stay on for a period of time and Typically, they're going to want that selling doctor to play by their rules during that time. And I'm talking years, right? And so we've all seen them, or you probably have colleagues that have gone through this. you got to be okay with that contract. That's where you need to have an attorney or somebody that helps you look through that, read it word for word, and, and understand what you're getting into because there's a reason they pay multiples. It's a business plan that they've done, and... They've done it many times, and so they know all the numbers, they know all the background, and they know what makes it work. One of those things is to have continuity of the staffing and to really make sure they're getting the most out of that selling doctor on an employment contract. Uh, the other kind of downside is it can homogenize the, the brand a little bit in terms of making that what used to be a private business conform to the corporate strategy whether that's the delivery of the services, the execution of the services, uh, how you market the company, how you sell to the clients, that's gonna largely be driven by the corporate structure. And so conforming to that can be tough, especially for somebody that has their fingerprints all over the business and has been able to make decisions on their own up until that point. So those are all things to think about. All good strategies, it's just a matter of what, how do you feel about it, what, what are your priorities, you know, what are, what are the non-negotiables. I know some people that are adamantly against selling to corporate even if they have to take a little bit of a haircut on the sale price and some that just want to go to the highest bidder, and I say, cool, to both, you know, do, it, do what you need to do, but it makes it much easier if you've thought through these things years in advance. And I work with a number of different transition brokers who help with these transitions, and they want to talk to people who are selling or planning to sell up to five years before that sale ever even starts to, to have negotiations. So it's never too early, and you should always be thinking about these things. Like I said earlier, even from day one, start in your mind thinking about what that strategy is going to be because it's fluid, it's dynamic, it can change over time, and that's, that's okay. But it, it's much harder to create from scratch when you're 60 days out from closing or, I mean, in worst-case scenario, I've seen emergency succession planning where something happens, whether it's health or a family emergency, um, just always makes sense when it comes to both retirement and succession planning to, to start as early as possible. So building a team is important as well, and these are people that you can have with you even before you get to a succession event or to retirement, people like business brokers, CPAs, attorneys, bankers, real estate experts, there is a number of people, just like how I cater specifically to medical, um, there's people like me in other fields that cater specifically to you guys and want to help and have experience working on deals just like yours or working on situations like yours. Determine a timeline for selling. Uh, this is when you really get close to the end here. And then once you get into it, I'd say 30 days on the short end from soup to nuts. 
it can obviously go as long as you want it to from there, but typically see these things go between 30 and 120 days once the negotiations are finalized and there's a purchase agreement in place. And then... Uh, I have a question for you. Yeah, yeah, please. Should there be any special considerations or concerns uh, if you're transferring a practice to a family member, for example, a father to a daughter? Yeah, I mean, I I would say like any merger acquisition, um, obviously all of the usual suspects in terms of legal and um, tax implications. Sometimes those are overlooked in a, in a, when it's closely held family and it's going to family um, because you're like, wow, well, you know, we talk to each other all the time. We're family. We'll figure it out it's still the same, the mechanics of the deal are still going to be the same. So you still want to make sure you're covering all your bases. Um, but I like those transitions in general. I think that that's, for, I mean, for, for one, it's, it's cool. I mean, it's, it's really awesome that you can see a second generation or a third generation come in and take over and continue this family tradition, which is great. But then also you do have that support network and, um, can can have somebody to lean on or to to, to provide support to. So I, those are another situation where those transactions I've done several work out really well. Um, but again, what I would keep in mind is you do at, at a point not not in a way that's cold or callous, but you do have to make sure you're covering your bases from a financial, legal, and tax standpoint. Uh, don't overlook those, and it's easy to do that when it's family because it's so personal. Um, but in general, uh, I really like those deals. Good question. I think too, in, in that situation, it's, it can also be really helpful to have that, have the, um, you know, son or daughter in that case, or family member, whoever it is. Um, start to earn some equity before they sell the whole business. So say, all right, well, if, if let's, let's meet the, again, let's go back to the mentorship discussion. Let's hit these different benchmarks, and at the end of the year, let's talk about giving you 10% equity in the business. Then they can have some skin in the game, and they can start to feel what that feels like to have some responsibility over the profitability of the company, have some management oversight, especially for these younger generations. That's really important. Is is they want one thing that we know about them is that they really want to have some authority, or they want to have some discretion. They want to have some leadership, some responsibilities. That's important to the younger millennials, Gen Xers, and so the earlier that you can get them some of that stake or skin in the game, uh, the better. And obviously there's financial implications and again, legal and tax implications, but I've seen that as an effective strategy as well is to have an equity play before they move into the full on acquisition event. You know, let them start to pick up some ownership responsibility before, they, before you sell the whole thing. Good question. Was there any other questions there or follow-ups? I hope that answered it. Uh, no, no other questions yet. Okay. Well, that's the end of my discussion. So the the what's next here is really is up to you. I like the the look of the the beach there. I mean, I think uh, you know if you wait, you talked about all the all the the issues that are we talked about all the issues the business owner has to go through. I, I think it it sounds pretty nice. If if your biggest issue of the day is is margaritas or daiquiris, that looks good to me. I like golf, travel, fishing. So if you line up these things on the front end. Obviously, tongue in cheek, but there's endless possibilities, and um, this is the upside of all the hard work. And, and it is. I mean, it's a multifaceted, can be a, a draining, arduous process. We talk about process fatigue when you're going through these mergers, acquisitions, buyouts, buy ins. But the upside, and especially if you plan early and often, um, is, is really nice. And that's what you put in all the hard work for at the end of the day is um, to, to have a successful successful ending to so what you put in all that all that sweat and time and and years into and so that's the end of my presentation if there's other questions or, or anything else that that people uh, are wondering about my contact information is here uh, so feel free to re that's my direct cell phone number reach me anytime uh, in terms of building out a team or if there if people are looking for references or 
are uh, wanting to to have people in other names to, to interview with a CPA, attorney, broker. I have a, a large network of people that I work with, so I'd be happy to talk about those things too. But Nicole, I, I appreciate uh, the time today and we'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Chandler. Uh, thank you very much for your time and helping us prepare for our futures. Um, even as, a, a, I, obviously I'm not a DVM or an owner, but I was able to take pieces from that and uh, have some ideas of my own personal uh, finances of what I should be doing. So thank you very much for your insight. And thank you everyone who uh, attended for taking time out of your busy day. Um, I will send you a link with uh, to the evaluation, so please put your comments there. And I'm already starting to plan for 2020, so that would be great if you could provide some suggestions of topics and or speakers. Um, and then I will email you your um, CE certificate for attendance. Thank you very much. Have a great day and week. Thank you.